It's now really my pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor Sandeep Sanchetti, the Provost of Mawadi University. Professor Sandeep Sanchetti is an institution builder, policy planner, um, regular columnist on various academic policies, promoter of sports in higher education, and well known for his intellectual strategic foresight. He holds a PhD from Queen's University of Belfast, UK, Master of Science Engineering from DTU, Delhi, and a Bachelor of Technology from NIT. I can't pronounce the name of that institution, sorry. He is currently the Vice Chancellor of Provost of Mawadi University. So welcome, Professor. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. David Lickhead. Very nice to join you. We are doing fine and hope you too are. Uh, no yeah. challenges, of course. Absolutely. So before we get into our formal conversation, I would thought we might spend just a very brief moment just mm -hmm. reflecting on COVID and the impact that it's having on um, you currently right now and your community of students. Sure. Uh, it's, it's having a huge impact. Uh, obviously, it's across the world. It's not only limited to India or some states in India. Uh, uh, there are positives and there are negatives of uh, all that which has happened in last year and a half called COVID. The positives is what I would be really keen on, that uh, we have started accepting change, which was not the case in education sector primarily, that we were very, very traditional, generally in India, maybe elsewhere as well. That's one thing. The second thing is the induction of technology, which was not very much welcomed or required or wanted. In fact, we were against uh, introduction of technology for whatever reasons, but suddenly the floodgates have opened. And fortunately for us, at least in India, there has been an announcement or uh, launch of what we call the national education policy you can also call it new education policy 2020 which is further catalyzing these changes that we need to improve we need to do something different and therefore the overall thing with covid is positive in terms of education space because it has opened up the negative side of course is the the lot of learning uh, which happens outside the classrooms which happens from peer to peer which happens in terms of skilling or hands-on or internships and things of those kind, those are suffering a little bit. But when it comes to the other activities, I think we have been able to maintain the routine, I must say, without loss of academic year or any time to our students. That's the, that, that, that's the that, current that, that is fantastic to hear because the, I think globally we have acknowledged that teachers and academics and educators have had an incredibly tough 12 or 18 months and right now communities around the world especially in India are feeling those impacts so what I thought we might do is we might move into some of your um, background leading up to your role as provost at um, have I got the name of the institution right is it Mawadi am I selling it correctly uh, it's fine. You can say uh, we in India, we say Marwadi. We just emphasize on M-A, Marwadi. So it's perfectly all right. All right. I will try my best to not butcher it too much with my Australian English. So um, you have a reputation for building some leading Indian academic institutes. And this gives you a unique vantage point to think about sort of what's happening in industry now, what's happening in institutions and where they're going. So my sort of initial opening question to you is, you know, how do institutions partner with industry around the world to and especially in India obviously to improve student outcomes what are some of the models you've seen and some of the success stories uh, uh, mr. David there can be many models uh, which we need to adopt one size fits all will not work one model serving the purpose will not work oh, fortunately we always call it industry Institute interaction but institutions themselves have started operating like industry now they're like businesses they need to make profit they need to have whatever input and output and whatever and therefore you can also call it industry to industry uh, interaction and then you have this simplified answer available that how an industry will interact with another industry it has to be a win-win situation for both of them i would say that uh, uh, most of the indian institutions are known for bringing the representatives of uh, industry into board of studies or faculty boards or the academic councils and senates various other such forums they will bring get their input and at times ask them to lead some uh, educational drives in terms of delivering courses or something like that 
to some extent internships also happen but may not be very very effective i must say because of our large number so these are the models which are currently existing but what we really need is a model right. where there is a duality model where the industry is also winning and we are also winning those models is when we do the uh, you can say the intellectual knowledge exchange or development and therefore india in, in uh, uh, indian institutions in india need to do lot with industry in terms of research development innovation entrepreneurship consultancy testing joint use of the facilities to cut down the cost and then of course a lot of uh, uh, long term projects for which the academia is much more ready and that cannot happen easily without a permanent connect between the industry and academic world and therefore i'll just give you one example to give the answer that how it can be different we have created a new scheme in marwadi and that is called as the faculty industry immersion program so every year some of the faculty members 5 to 10% of the faculty members can take plunge go to industry at the cost of the institution spend 10 to 15 days there learn what they do what are their challenges what are the tools and tackles they have how we can help them come back bring that knowledge deliver it in the classroom take those case studies and examples to satisfy your students or educate them and also in return sometimes call them to further supplement the education which you are delivering i think this becomes a permanent bridge if a faculty is a connect between industry and academic world i think it's a permanent bridge generally we have been doing only sending students and then they graduate and then they disappear and once again the link is lost so we are doing such experimentation that how to improve such models and make sure that the industry and academic world both are benefited but going further we might also do the joint appointment of faculty between industry and our institution we are still working on those models we have not yet implemented that that's fantastic and and what one of the things that's really interesting is i think higher education around the world is deeply thinking about the connection between academic world student studying and then moving into the workforce so i'm really interested around whether or not technology is helping you bridge the gap between a student's academic life and their employment life and maybe some of the examples you've seen around that yes i think uh, uh, technology has potential to bridge that but as i said it's only last one year since we have started experimenting with that or allowed experimentation with that and i'm sure in a year or two we'll see many good results out of that one fundamental reason why we will see good results out of that is uh, primarily because at least in indian context once a student enters let's say for a four year or three year program there is hardly any change which is allowed to happen during the course of delivery for those four years so the person who is getting admitted today possibly the course was or the curriculum was made one year back before it is offered to him so five years and let's presume that someone takes a break and does something or something else happens so he may graduate in five to six years for well, five to six years he is stuck in a in a program which was designed five years back six years back Can i ask and professor is that is that a regulatory requirement is it the regulation that's that's constraining that change to the course in real time it's not a regulatory requirement but our systems are so bulky that that kind of a freedom is not easy to give that you can change anything any time so like regulator simply says that you can probably uh, do it within a given framework but when we give enough amount of flexibility then delivery becomes a problem and if we don't give the flexibility then they are stuck with the stale uh, efforts which are there so that is the reason why i'm saying that technology once it comes in we will have new schemes i'm probably going to describe it in some other question if you so wish or otherwise i can do it right away and no, no, under the nd uh, one of the schemes which we have come about is what we call academic bank of credit so rather than an institution deciding about a degree uh, that which would be the degree what will be the constituents for the degree the student himself or herself can decide it so they will keep earning credits maybe from australia maybe from india maybe from iit or iim or my institution marwadi accumulate all that it will go into a certain central depository called academic bank of credit convert those credits into degrees diplomas and certificates and therefore the 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 high degree of flexibility 
will come in that now why this will help why this is required this cannot be delivered without technology your time frame is different language may be different speed may be different expectations and examinations may be in different modes and technology is required so once technology has come abc can happen once abc happens students can decide what is the course they want to do suppose i am doing mechanical engineering but i find that uh, there is not enough scope or jobs which i would like to do once i graduate i may in my final year or pre final year possibly take courses which may be uh, you know taking me in another direction where the jobs are available and therefore i can beat the trend or beat the staleness and yet be ready for the industrial jobs that is number one number two is in addition to whatever is delivered for my degree or my certification that's fine i can do wonderful things parallelly which is now allowed under the scheme that you can add more courses you can do something simultaneously though you may be full time in a certain thing and that means that my topping up in terms of my knowledge or in terms of my actions will also help me for job readiness and therefore uh, all these things will be supported by technology and technology will be very very important and obviously it has to be a digital technology as most of us know yeah and i think that's a that's a really interesting case in point before we sort of move on to start thinking about some other bigger picture before we move on one of the things that a sort of trend that we're seeing everywhere around the world i'm i'm interested around the indian context for it is the emergence of um micro credentials and short courses and the impact that they're having on predominantly in australia it's the postgraduate market i was wondering whether you can maybe just give us a little bit of insight about what your thinking is around micro credentials in in um mawadi university yeah so i'll not necessarily restrict it uh, to marwadi university i'll possibly say that uh, this is now coming up across all the institutions and not only the institutions across the educational domain that without doing these additional micro credits uh, one would not survive and uh, we are not uh, doing it only in terms of micro credits we are also possibly doing it at a macro level in a certain sense that we have started uh, minor specializations i may be doing a degree in computer science but may i may still do something in biomedical because i would like to apply it there so once you are in your second year or third year based on your credentials performance you are allowed to choose minor specializations and uh, very soon you'll find that the minor specializations will cross the boundaries of let's say i'm in engineering i'll need not choose the minor in engineering i may go in the science and humanities or maybe in the management and vice versa will also be true so these things have become important because uh, all the uh, uh, industrial work today or all the research today is not confined to a limited domain that i'm an electronics person and i need to know only electronics no that's not true for example mobile can be called as an electronic device but i know in my heart that most of it is defined by the battery half the weight half the volume is by battery which is materials and chemical engineering half of it goes into the displays and manufacturing which is mechanical engineering and for my electronics it's just a one single chip of 40 60 pins where everything is integrated so it's a it's a really integrated device and then most of its design and other things are based on this certain social angles certain designs certain aspects of ergonomics or maybe the costing which one can afford and therefore one as an engineer possibly need to know all these dimensions and therefore these micro credentials will always help and the best thing about the micro credentials is this is uh, uh, go as you please kind of a thing while i'm in service i've graduated i'm 25 years i've come into a job but when i move further in my job for next 30 40 50 years till 70 75 i may require many changes many new things to learn and those can be done through these micro credentials and i'm sure the industries and the companies will give value to these micro credentials in times to come and the final thing on this one is in australia i think it was in around september october 2019 there mm-hmm. were more students postgraduate students studying online than face to face in australia for the first time so the number of students mm-hmm. face to face they went the other way for the first time mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. Are, where do you where do you see india at the moment in terms of the number of students in the postgraduate space because the undergraduate is very different in the postgraduate space studying online or face to face where what what what's the mix at the moment 
Okay, uh, David, I would not differentiate between postgraduate and undergraduate here okay, because same our, post you. Okay. Yeah, our postgraduate population is much too less compared to our undergraduate. So everything in India as of now, if one is talking of education is defined by default by undergraduate education. Okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, under the current scenario, we are all without face-to-face -face mode. Current scenario means okay. in the last one month, you can say, because of the, uh, the, the, the second wave, which is slightly more uh, difficult for us to handle. So by default or by instructions from the government, we have confined ourselves to, uh, to what you call online mode. And not only the classes, but the examinations also, all kinds of examinations. And all kinds of competitive examinations, either they have been deferred or they have been served online only. When it comes to postgraduate education, some relaxation is there that the medical postgraduate, the pharmacy postgraduates, those postgraduates who are about to complete their projects and degrees are allowed to come to the campus. But once again, with a lot of control and checks and balances and isolation requirements and so that the, the wave can be arrested. So that's the current scenario. But the overall scenario which India is going to see and which we saw just before the onset of second wave was that we were heavily into blended mode. It can be the hybrid mode. It can be the flexible mode. It can be the high flex mode, whatever name we can give it. India had started experimenting. Some batches will come. We will do the batches of smaller classes or smaller sizes in laboratories rather than a class of 20 will make it 10. We'll call the students alternatively to the class so that you can attend classes on one day. I can attend on second day and once again, third day you come back like that. All those things were done. But since many students will come from far flung areas and also international students who have gone back to international domains, their respective countries, we were forced to do examinations generally in the online mode so that no one is deprived of, of the examination. The teaching learning can obviously happen in multitude of ways, but examination has to be a common thing. And therefore, online examinations were the must. But teaching learning, partly, you can say, was face to face also may not be more than 10 to 15 percent. But right now, it's almost zero percent. Yes, of course, of course, which is sort of a nice way for us to segue and think about, you know, the experience during the pandemic and now what it might look like as we, we um, move out of the pandemic. And hopefully that happens quickly for India. But um, I think about the student, right? So they're learning from home, they're learning from core, they're learning from work co-workers spaces, they're in libraries, all sorts of things. And I, I wonder out loud about how do we support the health and well-being of a student who's not physically coming to campus? What models have um, Mawadi put in place to support on those students? Okay. If I'm not wrong, you're asking about their well-being. Yes, Is that definitely. Right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, we need to be very, very open with our students in terms of what are the current set of limitations, current set of challenges. So there is a constant dialogue with them. Uh, though we have more than around 1,000, 1,200 international students currently residing, but we still try to deliver them education in their hostel rooms through online method only. We don't call them to the classrooms because there is a risk involved. However, we always have a communication with them in terms of how we are going about and uh, uh, how it's going to be supported. Fortunately, at Marwada University, we were always end-to-end -end technically connected. We hardly required any paper movements for anything, whether it is your attendance, whether it is your exams, whether it is your class. So that was pre-pandemic, uh, Professor? Is that what you're saying, pre-pandemic? Pre pre okay. See, see the, the group has an origin, to, uh, origin uh, from what we call from the shares or the financial world where the transparency required was of the highest order and so was the speed requirement in dealing and displaying anything. The same principles followed when we launched ourselves into education space and therefore going everything electronic. I hardly process anything in paper mode, whether it is my leave, whether it is my dispatches, which happens end to end, right from admission till the placement, everything happens. So fortunately that connect is always there. All the notices, circulars, everything is there. And it's been practiced for with us for last two, three years or maybe more and that all the lectures, which let's say I gave today and some students have not been able to attend, 
then those lectures by the evening will be hosted on our website on our internet for students to access so even those things are available so there was not a shock in terms of shock that oh we have to do all that and we are not ready i think some of the uh, uh, lmss and other things were already being used and in integrated into that most of the library resources were shared through some distribution mechanisms and online subscriptions and other things which were there so the only loss which has happened to some extent is the laboratory and there we have now started with the virtual laboratory experimentation we can call it v lab or online labs not that we have perfected it not that everything is available but the v lab is an initiative which government of india started but it was just kind of lingering people are not very receptive to it once the the covid came in last year suddenly there was a boom and boost to what we were doing online through virtual labs and that is now picking up that and and, and with that we can do wonders in the sense that uh, they can uh, suppose you have the high end equipment and i do not have i can connect with you and you can allow my students to do experimentation on that high end equipment since it's software controlled or whatever you can always build in all the safeties which are there i cannot damage the equipment or do anything wrong with that and so on so but there are many beauties which are involved in that so that part we are still developing for computer science domain a lot of things are available but for mechanical civil electrical those things we are doing another thing which we have done is the counseling which is very important so we have a, a student to teacher ratio of uh, 15 is to 1 for counseling so that counseling remains very very effective if they have any difficulties they can share in these well ones or collective ones we are now trying to implement almost uh, daily uh, feedback on the classes that's another thing which we are trying to introduce and these are some of the examples through which we are trying to make sure that students are not put to any discomfort uh, and of course uh, there is another initiative which we intend to start we have not done that uh, whatever can happen through our teachers or myself or anyone else is fine but we are still you can say that directly connected with our students sometimes they want anonymity so in india there are people who have started some some special groups or you can say uh, services uh, online services where the counseling can also happen with some anonymity and we can get the inputs and students can feel free to consult them and get help so even those will be roped in very soon by us so that all platforms and all kinds of opportunities are available for them for counseling etc and did you increase those support services during the pandemic or were they already in place and in train so most of these things are already in place for example i said 15 is to 1 counseling or the online attendances or lectures or lecture materials and all those are available but i gave you the last example that 24 into 7 anonymous uh, uh, service platform this we are going to introduce now so that people those who are slightly shy they may not speak up sometimes with their teachers very well and they can also attempt something of that sort but uh, in addition almost weekly there are standard practices can conveyed to them followed with them and we have we have allowed the environment to be as natural and as comfortable as possible uh, being more friendly with them in these testing times i think is the order of the day we have celebrated if there are some special things to celebrate we have celebrated that so that they don't feel out of place and uh, especially if there is a covid uh, impact on any individual best care has been done like uh, there are isolation spaces within the campus and they are served special food and so on so forth. so all those things are possibly make, keeping them very very happy and safe I have two questions from the audience which I'd like to put to you which is also a nice way for me to remind the audience if you've got questions put in the Q&A and we will we'll ask them at the appropriate time. There's two two important questions I think here and um um there's a there's a, a one of your colleagues not from your university but it basically said I feel that regular courses can be supplemented with deliverables which bring bridge gaps between what is being taught and what is required by in industry. Do you think that is a regular thing that's happening across Indian institutions? 
this is what probably I tried to cover in my first or second yes. answer I gave you, and that's where I called it an ABC, Academic Bank of Credit. It's precisely that, David. I may study partly in your institution, partly in my institution, let's say one student, but somehow he feels that he wants one specialization or course, which is neither available with you or with me. He, he need not be worried much about it because he can study it in MOOC form. He can study it from US. He can study it from another institution where teacher is good or timetable suits him or the content, either introductory or advanced level course, whatever he wants is available. All that is very much possible. It cannot be denied. And this is a scheme called student centric education scheme, or as we call education 4.0 in India, like industry 4.0. And yesterday I learned the the, the 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 new terminology. One of my friend ended up writing on my blog or somewhere here there that it is going to be a student 4.0 also, not only education 4.0. It can also be called as academics 4.0, whatever those names can be given. It basically means liberalization, openness, and those voids to be identified is a tough call. But to deliver and patch up those voids possibly would be easy. And therefore, the counseling systems will have to be very, very strong. I won't try and ask you to give me which one's going to come first. Is it going to be Industry 4.0, Student 4.0, or Institution 4.0? We'll leave that one as an open <laughs> question. We'll allow people or somebody else to think about that. There's another question which I want to ask, and then I wanted to jump into a couple of really specific questions. We've got about 10 or 15, 20 minutes left. So um, I wanted to ask you a question. I'm going to read the question because I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I wanted to replicate the, the questioner's question directly, which is, do we have the plans with social entrepreneurship and sustainability in rural India? Okay, I'm not an expert on rural India because I've never had much of chance to work there. Uh, fortunately, uh, by design or by, uh, not by design, by nat nature itself, Rural India is highly sustainable. I think uh, you will be under awe when you see some of the examples that how they recycle everything which is available to them as a resource. I think uh, uh, we in the bigger cities ought to learn from the rural India when it comes to sustainability. We were uh, in, a, in a culture of what we call use and throw very easily because the affordability was there and we thought uh, we need not worry about it. But certainly our eyes are getting opened up with pandemic, with the inclusion of SDGs all over the world, a lot of emphasis in India, a lot of rankings, ratings, assessments, accreditations are talking about that. And therefore the sustainability is coming into big picture, more so because now the financial viability is also becoming a big issue in the COVID times. So we are trying to save money wherever we can, whether it is uh, triple use of water, a triple recycling or double recycling and triple use of water or whether it is anything else doesn't matter india is a hugely solar driven country these days our solar power generation is almost three times cheaper than the power generation through conventional modes so all of us are going towards those kind of things a lot of uh, green and uh, environmental friendly materials are being used and now that we will not need too much of big buildings and concrete jungles to survive and make our institutions because many institutions will go in online mode. And therefore, you'll find that India in general would be what we call environmentally friendly and would be able to recycle and reuse many of these resources, etc., which are there. Rural India is most suited for that. Given an opportunity to me, if I have to establish a new institution, I will do it in rural India. And not only that, I'll do it there. I'll myself settle there permanently because that's the way where you can live in the most friendliest environment. And uh, so rural India possibly will gain in terms of advantage after what has happened through COVID and what technology is doing to education. Uh, this, uh, whilst we're talking a little bit about rural India, just a, a quick comment or question. Uh, it's really a question for you for comment, which is around the um, equity and also sort of like access to technology mm -hmm. and internet and um, infrastructure in rural India. Is it is it a issue that 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 institutions are considering or thinking about? And 
edtech companies, either Indian or Australian, trying to supply need to be conscious of? Okay. Uh, yes, it's a big issue for those who possibly don't understand about it. Not for a person like me. Uh, I would possibly call that uh, technology uh, uh, has been blamed to some extent throughout the world, and particularly in India, that it is a digital divide. I don't call it as a digital divide. I call it as a digital divide. I'm a technologist, a hardcore technologist, and therefore I can say that everything which technology has brought in into our life has become permanent, whether it is mobile or automobile, whether it's something in the kitchen, something in the living room or, uh, or your entertainment or your life, everything is technology driven. Unfortunately, education was not receptive to it and now it is changing. And you can possibly see the cost of data in India is cheapest in the world. The cost of mobiles in India is cheapest in the world, one of the cheapest you can say. So is the cost of automobiles one of the cheapest. Technology once sets in and mass produced, it becomes cheaper. And in this, uh, in these times, I would say the growth of technology or the speed with which the technology is growing or it's being implemented is becoming faster. You know all those examples that maybe the steam engine came in to reach two masses. It took probably 100, 200 years, whatever it may be. Something else came as phone, uh, the, the, the uh, plain uh, conventional telephone, PST and lines, probably took 100 years to reach whatever, or 50 years to reach whatever number. And what happens with the Facebooks and what happens with the LinkedIn's and what happens with the other Instagram social media. So implementation is becoming faster. Once the implementation becomes faster, it is, uh, it is uh, no different. Technology does not differentiate between rural and the urban India or urban part of the country. The connectivity which you and me have today between you and me, between Australia and India, is the same connectivity which will be there in a rural setting which is 10 kilometers away from my home. The same link, the same technology, the same delay or latency, and the same cost. So the, it becomes cost independent, it becomes time independent, and therefore technology does not differentiate. Technology is a big, big provider. I'm sure with India's potential, and we are generally technologically savvy, generally, I would say that education will be a very different world and there'll be no differentiation. The rural will once again, uh, probably come to prominence in terms of education, which was not the case earlier. So this is a really nice segue for us to think about the next thing which I sort of wanted to talk about. So let's let's keep your digital provide theme for a minute because I think it's a really nice theme. And I'm going to open it by thinking about the following. We have lots of Indian and Australian edtech entrepreneurs on our session today. Also educators mainly from India and there's some there will be some Australian educators as well. Yeah. And the thing in Australia, Australia's edtech sector is really focused on improving and supporting existing institutions, right? They're about trying to help them on their digital transformation. So my question for you is, in terms of digital provide, within your institution and other institutions. What's driving your adoption of technology there? What are you thinking about most? Is it about the educational outcomes? Is it improvement of engagement? Is it connecting to, into, to your university strategy? Is it about student needs? Is it about industry needs? What's the thing that's the top of mind when you're thinking about, I'm going to adopt some new technology? I think the simple answer to your question is all those points which you just narrated are the drivers for that. I cannot single out anyone that this is the one which is driving it or I cannot eliminate anyone because these are all important. Now imagine uh, that I wanted to study from a, a professor of Harvard or Stanford who was very well known. Can I afford it either in terms of time or money or effort or maybe the clearances or even if i go is it guaranteed that i'll succeed in what i wanted to learn with whatever intent i was going there it may not be true but today sitting here in india i can do that that is the reach of technology so if i may put it in simple words the technology makes it uh, repeatable makes it reliable makes it reproducible in addition to the cost components, which I have said, and makes it omnipresent. 
Now, these were all these characteristics were not there. Uh, David, if I ask you to lecture on one topic four times or uh, in a week to four different classes, I'm pretty sure in first one you will be doing something and good. Second one, you'll still do good because you are excited and you learned from first one how to improve it. By the time you go to third and fourth, you'll get bored that you're repeating the same thing. So repeatability is not there. Reproducibility is not there. Technology is a donkey which will make us very, very comfortable if you want to do such things. And therefore, technology should be used appropriately by us, in my opinion. Technology can always help the mankind do whatever they want to achieve without compromise on quality and cutting down the cost. So all those components that my students will have access and equity, please understand one thing. I just give you one example from our national education policy, NEP 2020. I do not know if some of you had chance to see it's sought after by the world. Many countries have started looking into the Indian policy and just one characteristics, one number I'm giving you from there. Currently in India, gross enrollment ratio is 26.3%, uh, 27.3%, they say in the report. And that has been achieved by independent India in 74 years, roughly 74 years. Now, this policy says in the next 15 years, we have to attain the GER to 50%. Please imagine, in 74 years, we have attained a GER of 27.3%. Next 15 years, we have to make it 50%. That means attain... Can I ask, what, what, can I, can I just clarify? Can I ask, Professor, yeah. can you just clarify, what do you mean by the 23%? Is that 23% of the population completing high school no. or a degree or what, what's, no. that, what's the yeah. percentage? This gross enrollment ratio is a term used across world for the 12th graders, uh, those ah, who okay. complete 12 years of formal study and go to colleges. Yes. Uh, what percentage of those 12th graders actually end up going into the higher education space? And that is a percentage in India. We have attained only what we call 27.3% in 74 years and next 15 years we want to attain another 23.3 percent and imagine that our base number is also going up the base is not fixed the people who are completing 12th would be more and more because our population base is growing is still growing and if that has to happen do you think india will have wherewithal to construct all that infrastructure have so many teachers to do all that which is a challenge even now and therefore Absolutely. technology will be the real base to deliver that and i'm pretty sure that dream which our nep has given to us the government which has given to us will be achievable purely because of technology so technology will be one stop solution for all the problems one pill for all the ills um, I, I will we'll finish in a second on our final uh, our last question to think about but I'll just my comment around can you build the infrastructure I personally have been driving around Bangalore a couple of times over the years and I can tell you that we don't need more infrastructure in terms of buildings in Bangalore we need some more infrastructure in terms of some other things so this I, I, I fully concur with you that a technical solution might be a really good thing especially in some of the uh, indian cities so this is a sort of nice segue for us to leave on one really big thought and that's for us to think about today we've been thinking about partnerships to drive student outcomes we've been thinking about partnerships to, to help transformation and you quite nicely use the term a digital provide which i'm sure i will will uh wholesale steel and use for many, many years to come. So thank you very much for that. So the question for you is, if we think about student outcomes for a moment and the things that they need to set themselves up for the future, how is your institution and even education providers in India as a whole helping service that? How are you supporting those students, gain those skills in a time frame that allows them to reach their own personal goal? Okay, uh, this is something very, very difficult in Indian context because uh, uh, my personal feeling is I also studied outside India. My personal feeling is Indian students are pretty shy. They come with a very conventional mold and therefore they don't open up necessarily what they want. Now, once that doesn't happen, it's very difficult to deliver what is required by them. However, uh, we can say that in uh, Marwadi University, we are trying to tackle it in a certain way 
and that is number one you can say that uh, the outcome cannot be one size fits all or cannot be generic for all that uh, everyone becomes a single kind of a uh, 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 performance oriented or delivery oriented that they can all do the same job i think that's a wrong thing every uh, one of the 60 students in a class of 60 will have different mind different speed different expectation and therefore we are trying to make sure that we are able to deliver that diversity in terms of this sitting in the same class you may be doing the advanced portion of that particular subject and i may be doing the uh, uh, slightly lower version of that particular topic which is there what we are trying to do is uh, we have very recently embarked upon and uh, it's just 10 days back we have decided that we have identified 10 generic attributes general attributes which everyone should have and i i can just give you an example of one or two one attribute which we will like to deliver to all the students irrespective of their discipline whether they are doing commerce or arts or engineering or medicine is that they learn the art of learning what we call it is a learnability okay then is a thing called leadership leadership doesn't mean that you have to contest in election and become minister or whatever represent your people leadership is you are able to do the things under your control you define the parameters and outcomes of that various things which are there and those are the attributes we are trying to deliver so what we are trying to say is i may be an engineer but once i graduate i may be a film star i may be doing forest conservation i may be a bureaucrat i may be a politician various things i can do though i am an engineer so we deliver those kind of attributes that one can define their life and change the direction change the gears change the speed as they move in their journey of their life well that must be the absolute goal of education so um, on behalf of everyone, Professor Sandeep Sanchar, um, Sanchetti, thank you so very much for spending time with us, giving us some insights to what the things that you're working on and where you're going. It's been an absolute pleasure. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this opportunity. Thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and all the audiences. Thank you so much for your questions as well. Hope thank to meet you. you sometime soon. Uh, when you come to Bangalore, do make sure that you visit us also. You're in you're in Bangalore, right? So when I was making no, my joke about traffic, no, I keep traveling, but yes, uh, oh, okay. uh, we, we are in Gujarat, the uh, western part of uh, India near Ahmedabad. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor.